Hey everybody, welcome back to Reach Out Reptiles. My name is Garrett Hartle, and this is gonna be our fourth and final video discussing a paper that we've been talking about to kind of kick off a new kind of long-term series we wanna have here on the channel about looking at the scientific literature and, and trying to answer for ourselves, what is a dwarf retic really? So we're looking at the review of the reticulate python back from 2002 and you know we know that some of this information is a little bit older but it's going to give us a really good background to look at how they are defining a dwarf retic. Historically this was a huge paper for me because when it was written in 2002 I was already a big fan of like the slayers and the jamps and some of the really unique localities that came from this island chain so it was really cool to see scientists look into that and confirm through the different lenses that they looked at the animals, just how distinct they were. And those lenses were, again, we've already covered like the geography, uh, the morphology of these animals, and then the phylogeny. So today we're looking at the phylogeny, which is examining evolutionary relationships between species based on their morphological or genetic characteristics. You know who does the best phylogeny stuff on YouTube though? Who's you that? guys know this too. You know who it is. I think I have a guess. So we actually have a special treat for you guys. Instead of just Hadley and I sitting here and talking about this kind of stuff, uh, since we don't have a lot of like snake visuals and stuff, we thought we would give you somebody visually stunning, and that would be Clint Laidlaw from Clint's Reptiles. Clint, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Every time I'm like, ooh, this is a particularly sciencey part of the topic, we better call Clint. And if you guys think that this is a fun kind of setup or you'd like to see Clint's reptiles on this channel again, go ahead and give us a thumbs up or let us know in the comments section below. So jumping in there, Hadley, with the, with the phylogeny of this, what, what is it that the paper was kind of setting out to establish? We were looking how they define the three subspecies of retics. We were looking at jamps, salayers, and then malins. So that would be Malaya python reticulatus, and then we have jampayanus, saputriae, and again, reticulatus. Right, but then once they started looking into the genetic analysis of this, doing like PCR cycling, different DNA sampling, they started to look at how these are separated into clades, and things got a little complicated from there. Okay, so what was your take on this when you took a look at this? Because Clint, this is right up your alley. I mean, you actually have a wealth of education in this field, right? Phylogenetics isn't my primary field of study, but it's very, very close and something I've become personally interested in. And I was also uh, had the benefit of, of one of the members of my lab when I was doing my PhD he was also doing his PhD on the education of how to teach people how to interpret phylogenetic trees. And so I, I got to have a pretty high level education in the interpretation of phylogenetic trees, even though I'm not trained in the building of phylogenetic trees per se. That was really my greatest education on, on interpreting phy phylogenies. So Clint, could you dive a little bit deeper for us? Could you tell us how you interpret phylogenetic trees? These trees, what they are is they're hypotheses explaining how you propose that these, these organisms are related. And then you can test it using other methods down the road, different sections of DNA, you know, different techniques, and see if that, that hypothesis holds up. The more ways that you build the trees and they, it, when they all end up telling the same story, that's very convincing that you might be pretty close to the truth. So there are two different trees that they create with their data. One of them is the maximum parsimony tree and the other one is the maximum likelihood tree. Um, we don't really see much difference between these two except that the maximum likelihood one looks more at evolutionary changes over time where the other one does not. As far as I can tell, they're both telling the same story. That means we've probably got something that approximates the truth. Oh, wow. So, so let, me, let me walk you through the story this tree is telling really quickly. The first thing is they, in addition to all these reticulated pythons, they also included uh, Python molluris. And the reason yes. they do that essentially oh, is so that, you know, you might have all these things that you think are retics that are super closely related to each other. And if you just looked at them, what you would find is how they're related to each other, even 
if one of them happened to be a garter snake in reality, you would still right. think it was a reticulated python. It would just be the least closely related to the others of all the retics. Well, so when I when I toss something else in there that I'm pretty darn sure isn't a retic, it allows me to see if something that is in this group that I think all goes together actually doesn't even belong in that group at all. So I've got this python malurus. It is the least related to all of these others. And that just gives you a baseline so that we can distinguish, you know, one ancestry and then the rest are all reticulated pythons. Exactly. It's showing that those, those, all, those, all those reticulated pythons, they are all more closely related to each other than they are at least to some other species of python. Right. Okay. Um, and so, so they, they, they're, they're somewhat closely related. Of those... That, that, that they looked at. The two Solaires and the Sulawesi are the most distantly related from all of the others. So they're, they're still more closely related to the retics than they are to um, the, the uh, Malurus python that they looked at, but they, they, they are each other, they're each other's closest relatives and they're distantly related from all the others. And, and so in this paper, they're trying to make an argument about which ones should potentially be subspecies you would have a very strong argument that those would be a different subspecies. You might even be able to make an argument that that would be a separate species right. if you were so inclined, depending on how much differentiation you required to define something as a, a species. Defining when something oh, yeah. is a genetically unique lineage versus a whole new species is kind of difficult to tease out. Like at what point does this isolated population become a new species versus just a genetically unique population of the yeah, same species. Sure. Tough question, and, but that would be, that's the least related to all the rest. And so they're, they're the most unique. What? If you were gonna call one a species, that would be the easiest one to make an argument that it's a species. If you wanted to call one a subspecies, that would be the easiest one to make an argument that it's its own unique subspecies. So how did the other specimens or localities fit into all of this? So all the remaining retics are more closely related to each other than they are to the Solares and the Siloaceas. The next most, and, and I might get the pronunciations wrong on these, uh, but the Sangihi would be the next most distantly related population. And so a very, very, not as strong as for the Solaire and the Sulawesi, but the next strongest argument for being a unique subspecies or even full species would be them all by themselves, okay? So, so that would be that would be number two because they are the next most distantly related from everybody else. And I do believe, for the sake of this paper, they had one of those snakes. Right. So you, when you find these like interesting little tidbits you may not have known existed before, I think it calls for future studies, which I am excited. Future studies have happened, and that's something that we're going to get into. So people have to stay tuned for that. But you're on the right track. So what, what, what yeah. I've been the most curious about is how the claim is made by this paper agree with the phylogenies presented by this paper. And, and okay. they have a Sulaire Sulawesi subspecies, and I say that is supported by, by the evidence they have here. The Sangihi is also one that they had as its own subspecies, and I think that is, sub, is supported by this paper. But they actually did not name Sangihi as a subspecies in this paper. They didn't. Okay, well, in that case... They said it was its own distinct population, but that's really as far as they went. Okay, yeah. well, I'm fine with that, too. It is a distinct population for sure. It would be your next strongest case to make for being its own subspecies, or even its own full species, just right. depending on how much difference and how much difference there needs to be for you to say, I'm going to call this its own species. Because I guarantee to you, and you probably know experimentally uh, firsthand that all of these can breed together. I'm sure of it. I'm also sure. pretty sure they can breed with Malurus. Then what you've got is, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples from, from six different populations, it looks like, because you got three from uh, Tana Jumpea. And we don't know which one of those is the next most distantly related. It could be yeah. any of those six. Okay, what, so, it, so the, the paper, what it is saying in this phylogeny is we don't have enough information to tease that out. The only yeah. thing I can tell you about the remaining three is the three Tanajampeas 
are more closely related to each other than they are to the other five. And it seems to me that the paper makes an argument that Tana Jampea should be its own subspecies. And I see no, nothing in this phylogeny that would support that at all. I think based on the phylo, this lens of phylogeny itself, we're not seeing as clear a distinction for Jampea as its own subspecies as we do when we looked in, you can go back to the earlier videos about you know, the, the geography behind where the animals live and the morphology and how different they are. I think that the Jampea is gonna be set up more on that, whereas the, the Saputriae is, is, you know, kind of set us apart here very clearly. It is interesting to me that, um, you know, they kind of skipped over that Sangihi population to pull a subspecies outside you know, from the jam with the Jampeas without addressing that. But I think they, they didn't have enough information from those other lenses about what that subspecies may be, you know. Um, and, and I think that one thing that it does clearly back up is the clear delineation and separation of the Saputriae or those Sulawesi, Sulawesi animals uh, versus how the Jampeas, they're theorizing these Jampeas probably got to where they are coming from a different direction, if that makes sense. Because when you look at it on a map, and you guys can go back to the geography, it, it looks like the Sulawesi animals are migrating down this island chain coming down from the north, and that the Jamps probably got there somehow from the south, looking at theories of like, little bit of land bridges that supported some some island hopping, you know, these reef-based islands and stuff like that. So it is a little bit interesting here. So it sounds to me like uh, other angles of investigation in this paper would lead them to think that, that the Jampeas are separate, but yes. their, their genetic analysis does not tell that story. And I guess that, that's, that would be my take home. Based on the phylo by both phylogenies, I don't think those phylogenies support that hypothesis of theirs. Um, but but Sangihi and Salaire with Sulawesi, those those could be teased out individually. But yeah, Dana Jamaica, and I think it seems to me belongs with the the remainder of these reticulated pythons, at least given the information that we had at this point in time. I hope I hope that's been helpful. I I really enjoyed getting to be a part of this. And, and I would, I'd love to, to join you again if you've got future phylogenies to study. Well, slow down there, Tiger. Don't invite yourself back onto the channel. I really feel like yeah. if our audience wants you back, they're going to have to let us know. Is, is uh, taken back then. Never mind. Never yes, mind. well, I, I do. If it was up to me only, you would come and work here at Reach Out Reptiles, Clint. But it is not up to me only. I only do what our audience wants us to do. And so they're going to have to comment below if they would like to see more of Clint's reptiles here on Reach Out Reptiles. But I certainly appreciate it very much having you on. That was a blast. I love geeking out with you about this stuff. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to see where this story goes as, as uh, time progresses and we learn more about these groups. I'm excited for the year 2005. What are we going to learn then? <laughs> Ooh, it's so futuristic. It seems so futuristic. So bringing it all together, looking at phylogeny, that does show us that Saputriae or Salaires tied in with a few of the Sulawesi specimens. There is data to prove that they are their own subspecies. But when we go back and look at all the data, so when we pull in information from morphology and geography, that is what shows us the definition of the jamps and the mainlands also as the subspecies. So in total, the three different subspecies, if you put all the data in there, that's when we can see it and determine that. So I'd say the ultimate conclusion is that everyone could really benefit from more research on this topic and really all topics and retics in general. And even the author himself, Dr. Alia, said that in his email, I asked him, what should we do next? What should researchers look at next. He said, when we're looking at retics, we should look at home range sizes of sexes and age classes. We should look at activity levels and then changing demographics due to harvest levels, which 
actually ties us into our next paper, which Dr. Alia was also a part of, that is the phylogeography of the reticulated python, conservation implications for the world's most traded snake species. And that is in going back in time, but not really based on from when this paper was written um, from 2017. Thank you guys for watching this series. Make sure you stay tuned for our next paper. But if you enjoyed watching this, leave a comment below. Let us know if you'd like to see more of Clint. That's it. And by the way, slaves are better too. There's a slip hazard back here. <laughs>